I'm going to say comes from this book, which was on the um, table in front. It's called Making the City Women Who Made a Difference. It is the story of 44 immigrant women who have made change to Toronto, many of them in the field of employment training services. So as I said to Andrew, probably he thought I, probably he wasn't sure whether I was joking or not, but this topic has a long history. And can we have my slideshow now? <laughs> um, so this book, Making the City Women Who Made a Difference, was recently published. It launched in November 2012. We've been working on it for over four years. It's the story, so the theme of stories is also a theme here this evening, as Sarana mentioned that the stories in, in your report. Um, so these are the stories of women who were involved in creating accessible, safe places and spaces for women to gather, organize, learn, and act for change. So immigrant women, you and me, make difficult choices to leave home, where to go, how to get there, how to support our families, where to turn for help when we arrive. I came to Canada in 1987 after 13 years of living in the Middle East. I left the U.S. in 1973 to start a collective community in Israel. It was, I was a very naive optimist who believed in social good and community living and intentional communities. So after 13 years of that, which didn't work very well, my Canadian husband, two children, and I relocated to Toronto. He didn't want to leave Israel. I did. I did a lot. And finally I said, I'm leaving. I'm taking the children. I'll be at my mother's. You can come if you want to. <laughs> um, so that worked. That worked. And we decided to come to Toronto because I wanted to be to, um, close to my family in the States, but Canada had universal health care, and we had two kids. And it was really hard. He got a job right away through Family Connections. I didn't. I did all the things I now tell people in my job not to do, apply to ads in the paper, send out resumes, and all I got back were a lot of letters that said basically, no Canadian experience, no Canadian education, no Canadian edu um, credentials, no thanks. But I was lucky when the going gets tough, the tough either go shopping or to graduate school, and I went to graduate school, now I go shopping. Um, and I was able to get a master's degree in community development. And that led to my job as an advocate for women's training and employment programs, which I have been ever since. Next. So what this book talks about are women who started to come to Canada in the 1970s. And many of them came to Canada as political refugees from Chile, from Argentina, and other countries experiencing civil war, revolution, and coup d'etat. They found a cold country, not just the weather, but the weather is cold. I cried the whole first winter we were here. I cried on the way to the bus. I cried on the way back home from the bus. I couldn't get warm. Um, but we also found that we were sometimes treated badly. We didn't have access to language classes. We suddenly had strange names. One of the women in the book, Marie Antoinetta Smith, who was a teacher in Chile, says, When I came here without asking, the government gave me a social insurance card with a name that wasn't mine. All my life, I had been Marie Antoinetta Smith. But immigration dropped the Antonetta and the Smith because apparently my second name didn't count. Anna Maria Minozzi, who was um, a colleague of Ratna Amivar, who was one of the first executive directors of Skills for Change, had the same experience. She said, when I came here, I found out that my skills, background, knowledge, and experience were not recognized, and that a sponsored immigrant woman couldn't get any benefits. I got really mad. The first thing I did was claim back my name. Then I made a number of phone calls and found the Immigrant Women's Health Center on College Street. All these organizations actually started off in St. Stephen's Church on College Street at College and Bathurst. There was a little enclave of four or five immigrant women's organizations. I wanted to know where women were meeting and organizing. This was in 1978. These women, together with many others, were the leaders, the pioneers. They started many of the organizations that today are providing services to immigrant and refugee women, including the Center for Spanish-Speaking Peoples, Working Skills Center, Working Women Community Center, the Immigrant, well, Immigrant Women's Health Center, Immigrant Women's Job Placement Center, which is now called Toronto Community Employment Services, 
and skills for change. Okay, so this is a picture of women in the 70s and early 80s organizing ESL classes for themselves. Um, they organized ESL classes, citizenship classes, <coughs> they took women to legal aid, and they helped to organize child care. Now, <laughs> women needed and continue to need job training, skills training, language training. This picture is from the Humber College Women into Electronics class for immigrant women. And that was a partnership with Working Women Community Center and the Labor Education Center. The course no longer exists, but many ages, this was a precursor or a forerunner, whatever word you want, of bridging programs. So this was one of the first bridging programs that moved immigrant professionals into their fields. Um, we don't have enough bridging programs, as I'm sure the people who work at Skills for Change can tell you, but we do have some and they're working really well to get people into good jobs. Other women um, whose stories are in the book help start organizations for domestic workers. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of this organization, but Intercede was started also in the 80s um, as a way for domestic workers to lobby for the right to become landed immigrants. They're one of the few categories of immigrants who can actually access Canadian citizenship, and Intercede was one of the organizations that worked really hard with, to lobby the Canadian government to get um, that status. They raised funds for the Immigrant Women's Mobile Health Service, so there was a van that went around to workplaces so that women who had trouble taking time off work could get medical care on their lunch hour or during their breaks on a regular basis. Um, they advocated for school programs in the language people spoke at home and school services specifically for immigrant kids. Other leaders fought for women's right to have interpreters. We take that for granted now, but that was a very new thing in the late 70s and early 80s, to have interpreters when they went to ask for services or to legal aid. Um, Marcy Ponty, the current executive director of Working Women Community Center, was part of organizing for better conditions for cleaners, giving them the tools and skills to advocate for themselves. There were sewing circles that turned into social enterprise, food programs, a whole range of strong women working with Im other women to improve their situation. So a little history, I'm always interested in history, and I think that sometimes we're careless about our history. Skills for Change was started in 1981 as Toronto Office Skills. The first thing they did was deliver English as a Second Language program to immigrants from Southeast Asia. It started with four women. They ran a 45-week training program. Nobody has a 45-week training program today. Four, 45 hours, maybe. Um, and everybody found work. Libby Ackerman, who was an original staff member at Skills for Change and who is interviewed in the book, says, The first day that the women were to go out and look for jobs, I woke up and they were talking on the radio about the recession and the rising unemployment levels. I thought, oh my god, what are we going to do? But they all got jobs. Over the years, there has been a great deal of research done and attention paid to gender-based issues in training and employment programs. A report in 2001 called Challenges and Connections, Meeting the Information Needs of Professionals Working with Immigrant Women, highlighted many of the same themes as the gender-based analysis done now by Skills for Change, as did another report done in 2002 by Working Skills Center. Both noted the need for a greater awareness of the barriers to women's participation and the importance of services having an awareness of women's issues. Okay. Most of the women interviewed in this book were feminists, some educated, so it's International Women's Day, so we're celebrating feminists. Some educated, some not, but they had a common cause, to make life better for themselves, their families, and their communities. They worked with unions like the Canadian Auto Workers and made sure that women were included. Laurel Ritchie, who recently retired from the Canadian Auto Workers, was part of that initiative and said, We took the position that to have a real organization in the workplace, the women, including those whose first language was not English, had to be organized. We were looking for people who were respected by their co workers, since leadership doesn't necessarily flow from those with the loudest voice. We helped people learn how to understand their rights. So this picture is a group of women who took their kids to Queen's Park, Ontario's legislature, to see how democratic governments work. I think then they weren't throwing things at each other and screaming all the time. 
Um, but they understood how important it was to understand the political process and to get involved with the political process to make change. Much of this work continues at the Workers' Action Center, another group started by immigrant women who saw a need, situated that need in a broader context, and created services to meet that need, like Skills for Change and the Workers' Action Center and many others who today continue seeing a need and filling that need. Okay. This book is the history of our city, Toronto, and our history. When we come, it's not so welcoming. This is a drawing by one of the clients at one of the services, and she scratched out, Welcome to Toronto. So you, you don't see the welcome, because that's how she felt. Um, but we adapt, adopt, change ourselves, strategize, join together, find ways to change the system. And there have been successes. For many years, there were women-only training and employment services, for example, that were very important in helping immigrant women access language training, child care, housing, and employment. You all will want to find ways to have an impact, make a difference, create change. Maybe not in the same ways, but in the ways you think are important to yourselves and your communities. Okay. Where we are now. Many of the issues immigrant women face today are the same as 30 years ago. When the women in the book, so this is from an International Women's Day March, actually. Um, when the women in the book started to try to make change, there is still no systemic approach to recognizing non-Canadian skills and experience. It now takes twice as long as it did 10 years ago for a skilled immigrant to find a job that matches their skills and credentials. But there have been some significant gains along the way. In 20 years, women have gone from holding 13% of public office to 33%. Women are making more when working full-time, 81% of what men make compared to 74% 20 years ago. We still have a long way to go. Anna Maria Minozzi describes this process as a dance, the minuetta. You go two steps forward, one step back, move to the side to avoid being hurt, move forward again. We are all dancers moving forward. Thank you. Mm -hmm.